I will I will shortly uh, introduce them to you. Um, first, we will have um, Ashraf Udin. He's the executive, executive uh, director of the Bangladesh Labor Foundation, um, which is a leading labor support organization working for establishing worker rights at the workplace in different sectors of industries in Bangladesh. Um, BLF is part of the Together for Decent Leather Consortium as, and has done uh, research in the leather sector in Bangladesh in the framework of this program. Um, second, we have Farah Parveen. She's the executive du director of the National Organization for Working Committees, now communities in Pakistan. And she was also lead researcher for the Together for Decent Leather Consortium. So both of them, they will explain uh, some more information about the leather sector in Bangladesh and in Pakistan. Um, then we have um, Elmi van Hoof. Uh, she is the sustainability manager of Goosecraft, which is a Dutch garment and footwear brand with a focus on leather products. And we have Sjul Bele, we, who is the project coordinator at the Social and Economic Council of the Netherlands, working on a project uh, regarding meaningful stakeholder engagement. So you know that this uh, session is on uh, stakeholder uh, engagement and um, uh, worker empowerment. So the focus uh, will be um, through that. Uh, I will. We will do like a, another a presentation uh, wise um, session, but more an interview wise session, so that it's more interactive uh, for you to uh, to also listen to. We understand that the Q and A function is working for some of the participants, so please use it. And uh, we will try to um, to answer your questions as well as we can. Thank you. So then we can start with the first um, with the first session, which is with with, uh, with Ashraf. Um, Ashraf, very much uh, welcome to the to the session. Um, very good to to have you here. Just for uh, the information for the participants, uh, the Together for Decent Leather Consortium is now together in Paris for the. Uh, in-person participation also in the OCD session uh, later this week. Uh, so uh, both Ashraf and Farad are talking from Paris. Uh, good to, um, to see you from there. Um, Ashraf, um, first of all, I understood that in Bangladesh, the tannery sector for the leather uh, industry has recently relocated from Hazirabagh to Savar. Um, but before the move, there were a lot of uh, labor rights issues uh, for the workers. Has that changed now uh, with the uh, with the move of the tannery sector? Can you explain something about that? Yeah, Sandra, thank you very much. Uh, you are rightly mentioned that uh, the tannery of Bangladesh has been shifted from Hajaribagh to Shavar in uh, 2017, with a primary objective to uh, address all the issues. Uh, to be a fully compliant sector. You know, Bangladesh tannery sector is the second largest export earnings after RMG. But the gap in between the RMG and the tannery is quite a lot, where the RMG is uh, um, earning like 46 billion, where the tannery sector is earning 1.7 billion. But um, uh, while we shifted from Hajaribagh to Shabar, we, uh, we thought that, okay, we are actually getting to a new place, to got, excuse me, sorry. We got um, uh, fully compliant and we got uh, to establish all the uh, labor rights and worker rights issues. But um, unfortunately, uh, till date, the workers' rights uh, have not been established apart from uh, all other uh, compliance issues have not been fully set up. Uh, for example, uh, you know, that there is no housing facilities for the workers, there is no medical facilities for the workers, and there is no schools, playgrounds, or canteen facilities for the workers as well. So these are uh, the rights workers has to be uh, get when they go to a relocated positions or a anonymous positions. So um, this is what uh, we uh, the workers are still struggling, and also there are uh, lots of workers are still traveling four to six hours a day for their job every day. So we are still struggling with the, uh, establishing the workers' compliance in the new areas. 
Yeah, I can imagine. And can you explain a little bit what you do as BLF with the workers? Uh, how are they? Uh, how do you work on worker empowerment, for example? How can you ensure that their voices are heard when it comes to compliance and, and improving their labor rights? Yes, uh, BLF, you know, uh, from our name, you can see that, that our primary goal is to the, um, work with the workers' uh, empowerments and workers' rights. So what we do, uh, we uh, capacitate workers, we empower workers, and we improve the capacity of the workers um, for a long run. And uh, we actually working um, for the workers to uh, being uh, a negotiated persons inside the factories, inside the management. Uh, as BLF, we are not working only working with the uh, workers. We are uh, in the tenaries in Bangladesh. We are working as a holistic approach uh, in between the um, employers, mid-level management, workers, and um, governments as well. So, but uh, our major rights to establish the workplace environment, apart from the establishment of the workers' basic rights, it starts from the uh, job card, um, I mean, the service rules, service books, uh, as a whole to establishing the uh, national and international labor standards in the workplace. Thank you. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. I guess you have achieved some uh, results on that. Um, and then going into the, the, the issue of stakeholder engagement, the OECD guidelines, they, uh, they indicate that uh, brands should do meaningful stakeholder engagement while doing their uh, due diligence. Um, what is your experience with that? How are brands doing uh, doing that in the, the Bangladesh uh, leather sector? This is a very good question you have been pointed out. Uh, actually, uh, through this project, we have tried to reach out the brands uh, through emails, through webinars, uh, through many sources. But we did not uh, get that much good response. We only got few responses, but which is not very, very lucrative. So uh, this is uh, very important uh, to act when the stakeholder, when the uh, I mean brands and buyers are sourcing, uh, they should uh, think of, uh, definitely they are thinking of the business, but they should think of the fair uh, purchase and fair business. So uh, um, in Bangladesh tenery sector, we are still lack of these things, but uh, the stakeholders engagement should be a, a, in a inclusive manner. I mean, it's not only the, um, I mean, uh, buyers and uh, producers, in, not in between that, but uh, the civil society's engagement is also very important for the stakeholders engagement. So uh, this is important. And uh, uh, nowadays, you know, in Bangladesh, tenary is not uh, what we have seen that, that uh, the sourcing is not clear and uh, the transparency is not clear to the, from the buyer's end. So this is uh, uh, also needs to be established. Uh, when uh, the, I mean, uh, we have good example in Bangladesh RNG sectors where there are process been established, the transparency has been established a bit. I'm not telling that 100% we have uh, achieved, but we have achieved a major uh, concern, some concern, major concern areas. So in leather sector, we can uh, go through that same processes and also uh, the uh, fair purchasing and fair um, uh, fair practices needs to be established for the uh, sourcing from the Bangladesh tenaries. Yeah, so you have some recommendations for the brands on how to uh, how to engage, and and you are open to engage with brands on uh, to have a stakeholder uh, to be uh, to be asked as a stakeholder for your input uh, regarding the due diligence, etc. Definitely, definitely. As a civil society organization, we are also doing in the um, uh, local levels, but uh, we, it needs to be uh, uh, in a global level as well. Thank you. And um, as you were already uh, explaining, hey, there are several issues in the Bangladesh uh, tannery sector. Um, and after a lot of efforts, there was a national action plan hey, for the Bangladesh tannery sector. Um, that is quite an achievement, I uh, I can assume. Um, and how do you ex assess as uh, as BLF um, the national action plan in terms of stakeholder engagement? Yes, um, this is a great achievement in the um, uh, local level. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is the first time ever in Bangladesh when a civil society organization like Bangladesh Labor Foundation take the initiative, uh, uh, where all the major stakeholders are the signatories of the National Plan of Actions, which includes uh, governments, 
which includes the workers union, which includes the different ministries. Uh, this has been led by the Ministry of Labor and Employment in Bangladesh. Uh, we think this is a very uh, uh, great achievement from our points of view because, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have done, you know, uh, by the, uh, signing this uh, national plan of action, all parties are actually agreed that the compliance has not been made in the factories yet. So we have to maintain the uh, compliances. So this is actually a uh, guideline and this is the, like a, uh, we, we say this is a Bible for the tenant sector uh, for next few years so that the employers can achieve uh, all their um, compliance uh, measurements through this national plan of actions. Yeah. And is there something that uh, the countries where the brands are um, are based that buy from uh, from Bangladesh, what the countries here can do uh, to support the national plan of action? And, uh, of course, also ensuring the, the workers' welfare? Definitely. As I mentioned earlier, the, the sourcing countries, the brands and buyers, they should also look after the factories' compliance issues. They should be engaged with the local level stakeholders. It should be a, I mean, a platform where the, uh, the, the audited process or the purchasing process should be ensured in respect to the workers' issues and in respect to the um, quality of the products as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ashraf. Um, Thank you so much. This, your, first, uh, your first contribution, it will not be your last in this uh, session, but thank you for now. Um, I would like to, um, to go to uh, Farad um, and, um, and have some conversation with Farad on, uh, on Pakistan. Um, we are changing chairs in Paris. <laughs> Parat, are you there? Yeah. Hello. Yes, you're still without camera. Yes, there you are. Hi, Farat. You're um, from uh, the National Organization of um, Worker Communities in, in Pakistan. Yes. Um, you have done research uh, also, well, uh, in, the, in the framework of the Together for Decent Leather um, uh, Consortium. You have done research in the leather and leatherware uh, sector. And you've also supported workers to, to claim their rights. Um, as this is the session on stakeholder engagement and, and, and worker empowerment, um, can you share some examples of, uh, of your work on worker empowerment and, and how stakeholder engagement has uh, contributed to improve uh, workers' rights? Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Uh, National Organization for Working Communities has, uh, you know, contributed in this project. And uh, I wanted to mention here that, uh, you know, there was a gap in research on the leather sector in Pakistan. So when we shared this, the our findings, uh, they have been welcomed by the community of researchers and trade unions uh, and other stakeholders. So this, this was one of the, uh, I would say, major contribution from our communities. And then, uh, you know, uh, as you can understand by our name that we are based in the communities and we also have contacts with workers in the factories. So uh, during our research, we met uh, one of the factories uh, which, uh, you know, works uh, for the buyers in, uh, uh, in the sourcing countries. So there was a problem of, uh, you know, uh, Workers were have not been paid the minimum wages in uh, in that factory. So they uh, uh, approached us, and uh, uh, Arisa also approached us, uh, and uh, they said that you know you uh, we need to go and check whether the minimum wages were paid or not. So we went there. Uh, we spoke to the workers in their communities, and uh, they said that they have not been paid the minimum wages. We then uh, go to uh, the Labor Department in uh, Karachi and uh, the civil society that works for labor rights. So that's how we have been able to ensure that the workers uh, would get uh, the minimum wages in their factory. Yeah. So those are examples that you um, have uh, experienced in your own uh, 
uh, work of uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, I have also, have, we, we all know that uh, recently in December, uh, the International Accord um, uh, on Worker Safety has been uh, extended also to Pakistan. There's a work, worker safety program in, uh, uh, in Pakistan, started in Pakistan. It will also cover uh, leather garments. Yeah. How do you look at, uh, at this accord? You know, it's a very welcomed uh, initiative uh, in Pakistan, and we have been part of the process when uh, negotiations were uh, going on, uh, you know, whether the <clears throat> accord would uh, be given to Pakistan or not. So uh, I think it's been at least one and a half years. So one and a half years uh, when, uh, I mean, during that time, we have been in the negotiations and we requested the uh, accord to include uh, leather garments as well. And I mean, their efforts should not be restricted only to uh, the occupational safety and health. So accord has uh, agreed to, uh, you know, increase their influence uh, to ensure the availability of other human rights and other workers' rights um, in the in the court. Thank you. And um, in, in relation to uh, to your work, um, any other uh, examples that you would like to share on uh, worker empowerment um, that can be interesting for the for the participants on this uh, on this session? Yeah, you know. Uh, uh, there was an accident in uh, in a leather garment factory, and uh, and we uh, when uh, it came to, uh, yeah, to our knowledge, uh, we went to speak to the workers, and uh, you know we compiled their data, uh, and uh, we shared it with other uh, labor organizations in Pakistan. Then we held a press conference that the employers are denying that they have. Uh, there was a sabotage and it's not an accident. So then when we went to uh, other organizations and we then uh, when we shared our data, the, which we have collected uh, from the communities, uh, when we shared it, the labor organizations uh, got together and we held a series of uh, press conferences uh, to highlight the issues of uh, that particular factory. Uh, and in that manner, you know, uh, we have been able to engage the labor department, uh, which is responsible to ensure occupational safety and health at the workplaces. So they went there, they tried to do their best uh, to, uh, you know, so that the workers could get compensated. So, uh, and then workers and uh, the employers, you know, uh, have been able to achieve, to reach a contract. So the workers uh, got, you know, I wouldn't say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, they have gotten what they were supposed to, but uh, uh, at least we have initiated the process. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we will get back to you um, uh, for the, the questions and, and answers uh, later in the session. Um, so I would like to thank you now. Uh, and. Uh, go to the the third panelist of today that that means that we uh, we uh, stay in europe <laughs> from paris to uh, to uh, the netherlands um and i welcome uh, elmi elmi van hove who is the sustainability manager of uh, of goosecraft uh, a dutch uh, garment and footwear brand um, with a lot of um, leather products in um, in the in the house so to say um, Elmi, thank you for um, for being here. A very good to to have you in this session with a perspective uh, from a brand side. Um, so it's really good to uh, to hear your uh, experience. Um, and maybe you can uh, explain a little bit uh, to us and to the participants in this session. How do you, as Goosecraft, engage with uh, with stakeholders um, when you do your due diligence uh, practices? In and if you can give an example on, on how you do that. Yeah, thank you, Sandar. Uh, happy uh, to be here. Um, we engage with uh, stakeholders in different ways. Uh, it depends on the topic. 
for example, uh, the multi-stakeholder collaboration uh, uh, during the Dutch Covenant for Garment and Textiles, which has ended in December 2021. Uh, it has guided us a lot in getting started uh, with our risk analysis and our due diligence process. There was a lot of uh, knowledge sharing between the brands, but also uh, the different expert organizations that were linked uh, to the Covenant. And uh, several projects were initiated, uh, such as the Freedom of Association project uh, we participated in. Uh, I feel such sectoral initiatives uh, facilitate easier uh, collaboration between the different uh, stakeholders in the field. Um, another uh, more recent example was that last June, uh, we actually had a meeting uh, with uh, people from now communities in Pakistan, uh, Sividab India, uh, Somo and Teresa. Uh, they shared their findings and activities with us uh, as part of the Together for Decent Letter program. And afterwards, we also shared our approach and we had a very open discussion uh, on the current local uh, labor conditions and also uh, the necessary change uh, within the sector. Uh, this was very valuable for us. Um, for me, it was the first time. Um, and um, uh, for Goosecraft, it was very valuable as it uh, has gained a lot of insights for us. And after the meeting, uh, we kept in contact uh, with Arisa uh, on how we can improve further and, and also how we can collaborate in the future. And we are still doing that. Uh, very practical, uh, recently received feedback um, on some of our resources we use for our due diligence process, and we are working on improving them uh, based on their insights. Um, I want to give one uh, third example um, because it's close to our heart as well. Um, we uh, request our suppliers to give feedback on our own buying practices as a business partner. Um, in our annual, we call it supplier speak up survey. Um, this survey acts as a basis to improve our code of conduct and uh, also mainly our um, yeah, how we um, um, yeah how we buy uh, towards our uh, suppliers. Uh, we want to know where we lack and where we should improve, um, and therefore we ask for honest and critical feedback. And uh, yes, we do also receive it. Uh, but in order to get that, uh, we feel it's very important to have a basis of trust. Um, we work uh, uh, with our suppliers, or most of them, for a very long time. Um, and um, yeah, this base of trust, it comes also with years and with open discussions. And, and then this helps with discussing uh, certain sustainability and due diligence uh, topics. And I feel that this goes not only for uh, relationship with the suppliers, but also um, with many collaborations in the sector. Thank you. And, um, and so these are the, the examples on how you have uh, reached out to, to your uh, suppliers and, and to stakeholders um, uh, in the field. Uh, can you say a little bit more on, on what does it bring you as a company? Uh, how does it help? Uh, how is it an added value um, in relation to other uh, activities that you do in the framework of responsible business conduct? Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, yeah, uh, some due diligence topics are quite complex, uh, and I think uh, everyone in the field is still learning. Uh, there is no clear marked set of steps, and then suddenly everything is perfect. Uh, as we have just heard, there are very important uh, human rights issues within the sector that we have to solve together. And we believe that as a brand, being at the end of our supply chain, we should be open towards the experience and the knowledge that is already out there uh, in our supply chain, but also outside of our supply chain. So um, with our local colleagues, uh, with our suppliers, with NGOs, with civil societies, with other local parties, uh, and also with other brands. Um, what I like is that there's uh, always a possibility um, yeah, to talk to someone to understand how uh, they are working on improvement. Uh, you learn from that. Um, CSR topic is not something you should compete on, but something you should collaborate on. And I think uh, as brands operating internationally, it is good to be uh, part of these international networks. Um, for example, um, last December, uh, we were invited by Arisa to a meeting in Amsterdam with uh, Pakistani uh, unionists and the labor unions, they shared their insights and even personal experience, uh, which was honestly, uh, it was impressive, but unfortunately not always uh, very positive. Uh, but we do believe that it's necessary as a brand to hear about these experiences firsthand um, as yeah, you need like a good um, understanding of the social, economic, political and cultural uh, circumstances 
also in the country you're sourcing from because only that way you can actually uh, help and uh, do your due diligence uh, correctly. Um, it's not always easy. We are here in, uh, in, in the Netherlands and our uh, supply chain is mostly located in uh, South Asia. Um, but therefore you do need uh, yeah, stakeholders, parties uh, you can collaborate on. Uh, for us, this is still relatively new as well, uh, but we do believe that uh, this is the way to go. Uh, we cannot do it on our own. Um, I think that's the main message uh, I want to give. Um, we are currently working on a five-year plan uh, with goals on sustainability, uh, different, yeah, different uh, parts of sustainability, as I think a lot of brands are doing. Um, but um, yeah, in order, we feel that in order to do this rightly, uh, we also ask for suppliers, and we also want to ask other stakeholders. Um, yeah, how, how they feel about this plan, if it's workable, especially suppliers. They are a big part of our goals, let's say. So we also want to hear uh, what they feel on these goals, uh, also on the uh, struggles and possibilities they see. Um, because if you do not ask, uh, you do not know. Um, and I think uh, you should never be afraid or scared to ask. Um, that's not a, it's not, it's not, you should not be embarrassed about that. Um, I feel you should only be embarrassed if you do not ask, if you do not want to know. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Elmi, for uh, for sharing and for sharing also the the the, the complexity of uh, of the issue, the fact that it's not easy, um, um, and the the yeah, well, what you say, the main uh, aim of wanting to know is uh, is uh, I think important and an important recommendation maybe for other brands uh, participating in the session and um, that uh, we all can reach out to um, uh, also after the session. Um, we will get back to you as well uh, if there are any questions. If you see questions in the Q&A that you can already uh, answer, please uh, feel free to, uh, to do so. Uh, I see that one participant has uh, a hand raised up. Uh, please um, um, stay with your, uh, with your hands or with your questions until uh, after the, the, the next speaker, because then we have the whole input for this session um, um, uh, done and uh, we will have time for uh, some questions from your side. So when you are able to put them in the Q&A, please do so. And if not, I will, um, I will look at the, the raised hands after um, hearing Jules uh, from the Social Economic Council. Thank you, Elmi. And welcome uh, to Jules. Uh, Jules, you are um, um, a project coordinator for the Meaningful Stakeholder uh, Dialogue uh, Project uh, from the Social Economic Council. Um, can you explain a little bit why uh, the Social Economic Council started uh, this project on stakeholder uh, dialogue? And if there are already some outcomes that you can share with us? Yes, of course. Good morning, uh, Sandra and everyone. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and providing uh, the opportunity to share our insights. Um, as has been stressed in this session already, um, and what the OECD guidelines uh, uh, do too, is the importance of meaningful stakeholder engagement throughout the due diligence process. Um, so SER experience from the sectoral agreements, including the agreement for sustainable garment and textile, is that companies struggle with this, particularly when holding an actual conversation. Um, as it is rather unclear what meaningful actually means and how to achieve it, uh, next to the question on how to scale it up. Um, and that's why we want to provide companies through our project uh, further guidance on what it entails to conduct a meaningful dialogue with your stakeholders and how to achieve it. Um, so a first step uh, towards this goal is our concept of meaningful dialogue. And that has been published in Dutch last week uh, and an English version will come online by the end of this week. Um, and that document, that concept, we'd like to stress that it's not, let's say, a final version. It's still a working document because in the next months we will put the concept into practice by using it in actual dialogues and evaluate its applicability and, and usefulness. So just to give you a little bit of, of a feeling of what the concept is, um, it's to a large extent based on dialogue literature and on the analysis of case studies. Uh, in which we studied multiple types of multi-stakeholder dialogues among various sectors. Um, and then the concept consists of, uh, so we identified in the process in the analysis, 10 
interconnected uh, elements that contain considerations, key values, prerequisites, and possible actions that a company can apply to the specific context of the dialogue that needs to be, uh, be conducted. And so we argue that a conversation, uh, let's say a, a normal conversation, can turn into a meaningful dialogue if you take into account all those 10 uh, elements while preparing, conducting, and following up on, um, on the dialogue. So it's, um, you know, we identified 10 elements um, and they are, let's say, the, the business case or the reason why you should do a uh, dialogue. Uh, it consists also of cr criteria for dialogue, which include commitment, inclusion, and transparency, uh, as well as six other elements that are particularly important during the implementation and support uh, of the dialogue. Yeah, so you have uh, used very specific examples as, as case, case studies. Um, and from those, uh, you, you share some, uh, uh, that there are different uh, steps um, uh, needed. Uh, can you share a little bit more, like, like how companies can really use the concept that you have um, uh, elaborated based on the, on the case studies to really involve and engage more uh, with, uh, into mm -hmm. a dialogue with stakeholders? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to the, those 10 elements also in the light of this uh, of this session, um, it's interesting maybe to dive a bit deeper into the element of collaboration um, because it's important to put emphasis on the preparation phase of the actual dialogue. Um, and that's a phase where in particular the cooperation between parties comes in. Um, we see that collaboration provides companies access to relevant information and insights that would otherwise be difficult to obtain and vice versa so that you learn from from each other as has also been discussed in the previous uh, inputs this this morning um, and this can be useful in order to set up a dialogue more thoughtfully uh, and effective and it also enlarges the support for dialogue and the network connected to it so cooperation can, for instance, uh, be crucial to get relevant persons at the table, uh, thereby making the dialogue more inclusive, um, which is another element in, in our concept. So that's why we consider um, collaboration to be a supportive element um, uh, related to the rest of it. Um, and when it comes to collaboration, we identified three, uh, as I said, each element consists of, let's say, prerequisites, preconditions and actions. And when it comes to collaboration, we found three uh, preconditions to make it work. Uh, first, parties are able to provide a relevant contribution and are willing to cooperate. So both sides, both the brands as well as the stakeholders that you uh, involve in the collaboration. Um, parties are willing to invest time and resources to build up a collaborative relationship, which is based on equality. Um, and thirdly, the roles, tasks and expectations among the various parties are clearly um, agreed upon. And what we then advise in our in our concept is that as a company, it's, it's really important to understand which party is relevant uh, to the topic of discussion and this of added value, value. So you really need to get to know which organizations, local organizations are out there and in which sector or region, what they do, uh, how they compare to each other and which relevant uh, connections they have. Yeah, and is there like a specific example maybe both good or bad that you can share something about like to make it because had it, it's clear that the, the preconditions that you describe but to make it a little bit more practical on, on how that really works is there something that you can uh, share from the uh, the case studies that you studied like yeah of course, yeah, I would say actually the input that has been given in this session has also been uh, one of the case studies that uh, that's part of it. It had to do with um, um, uh, with with the new legal minimum wage uh, in in Pakistan, um, and for that um, uh, information was shared, let's say, through uh, via local organizations towards uh, organizations in the Netherlands towards brands. So there you saw that information sharing. Um, and there you see that it's really important to, to get to know this information in order to prepare your dialogue, let's say, with your stakeholders, so with your supplier uh, on this topic. Uh, so you see that it's really hard to, to get to know the, 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 the real situation in, in a production country, and for that you really need to collaborate uh, with, with partners or with stakeholders uh, locally 
in order to to be prepared uh, for such conversations. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. I think um, it was really uh, interesting for to share uh, because it's like uh, we organized this session on stakeholder engagement. You study the issue of uh, stakeholder uh, dialogue, and um, I think it's uh, for everyone interesting to um, yeah to know about the different. Um, um, case studies that are there, the different examples that are there and how we can learn from these examples. And I think from the preconditions that, uh, that I hear from you is that willingness is an important, um, an important part, uh, willingness to, uh, to enter into dialogue and then willingness to invest uh, uh, time and, and energy into it. Um, that's an important um, uh, learning that I take from, uh, from your um, from your uh, presentation. Um, thank you, uh, Jules. Um, we have some um, uh, questions um, that uh, are being answered already in the, in the chat. Um, and um, I also um, see there's a question for, uh, for Elmi. So maybe Elmi, um, you can um, uh, shortly uh, answer this question. Um, because th th there was a question on why you you source from Bangladesh. I know you do not uh, source from Bangladesh, but is there? Can you maybe explain a little bit on um, uh, why you uh, source from uh, Pakistan and uh, other South Asian countries? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, the easy answer is that yeah, we have been sourcing there uh, for more than ten years already. Um, um, Goosecraft started in two thousand six, um, so I think that's the the first uh, yeah answer, and we do not want to change that. Um, it's as I just said also in a presentation, we value the long term relationship we have with our suppliers. Um, because that makes it, uh, it's, it's in terms of quality, but also in terms of sustainability, you can have uh, better open discussions. Um, and also because of the leather expertise in uh, these countries. That's the most important reason. Thank you. And then um, uh, to Ashraf and, and Farah, there were several um, uh, questions to you in the, in the chat. You already answered them in, uh, in writing, but maybe there's something you would like to add in, in addition to what you have written as an answer in the Q&A. You are, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think uh, there is some interesting questions in there. Like uh, someone asked that uh, that there is no intermediaries in between the buyers and uh, brands and the tenaries. So I answered these things actually. Yeah, it's not been. Uh, that's what we have mentioned that you know the brands and buyers are still not uh, much aware of the um, uh, uh, factory workplace environment issues and also the compliance issues. So they need to address all the uh, workplace issues and uh, uh, compliance issues in respect to, actually, we are not uh, only speaking on the worker rights issues, it's all about the uh, full compliance factory measures so that uh, you can get the quality products uh, over in the sourcing countries. So uh, definitely, definitely, buyers should engage in the uh, bottom level, not uh, on the top. They should be engaged on the field. Thank you. Thank you. Farad, something that from the from the questions um, is something that you would like to add. shed your light on? Yeah, you know, uh, there was a question about the existence of trade unions in the leather sector, uh, and I responded to it. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that, uh, you know, we came to know, uh, I, I am part of the uh, Labor Standing Committee in Sin, which is the uh, one of the provinces of Pakistan. And we came to know that there are uh, many unions which actually do not exist and they have been uh, registered by the employers. Uh, they have colluded with the department and they, you know, registered those unions. They don't exist actually. And we have found such unions, such uh, paper unions in, uh, you have might have heard about the yellow unions, but uh, you know, the paper unions, <laughs> Uh, exist in Pakistan. 
but there are some unions, uh, some real unions, and and the conditions of work uh, uh, are much much better in those union uh, uh, in those factories where unions exist. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. And I want to address one point. You yes. Know. Um, from the buyer's point of view, uh, I think uh, fair price is also very important to make the um, workplace compliant. So uh, this is another important factor. If we want a good wage in the factory level, if we want to improve the workplace environment uh, with all respects, so buyers should act responsibly from their point of view and from their end. That is also a very important factor when we see the price is low. So then it's very difficult for the employers to be sustained in the field. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And is that some, sorry, yeah, Farad? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add uh, that, uh, and I agree with Ashraf that uh, fair pricing is very, very important. Uh, but I, I also want to emphasize that, you know, the process of uh, compliance uh, should be, uh, you know, uh, should include the civil society and, uh, you know, uh, labor representatives in it. Because if you don't do that, uh, you will just tick the boxes that, okay, do you have a trade union? And then employers will show you that we have a registered union and you will tick the box. So to know the actual situation, uh, perhaps compliance process needs to include uh, trade unions and uh, labor representatives and CSOs who are working with the labor in Pakistan. And yes. there should be some there should be some mechanism of uh, you know compliance uh, uh, complaint mechanism for workers uh, yep. in those factories where you uh, from where you source. Thank you. Thank you. it's uh, it's uh, enforcing the fact that we organized this session on on stakeholder uh, engagement. Maybe uh, in relation to um, to fair price. Elmi, uh, can I uh, ask you how you are as Goosecraft uh, working on, on, uh, on prices? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, multiple ways. Um, for, for, look, I'm sustainability manager for, uh, for me. I'm not doing the prices, but uh, my colleague who's sitting next to me uh, is the production and buying manager. So she can uh, tell a little bit about that. Uh, in a few uh, seconds, let's say. Um, but what I do want to say is that we also the the survey I just talked about in uh, uh, previously. Um, this the part on buying is also very important in the survey. So we do also ask about that. Uh, let's say um, directly in, in this, uh, and we also do get, as I mentioned, uh, honest feedback on this on that, which we uh, yeah, which we then use to improve. Um, and um, we are also, um, we're not there yet, but we are also currently uh, looking at how we can go further, as you know, um, with uh, not the minimum wage, but the living wage. Um, but that is not something we are there yet, but we are working on this with uh, the help of uh, other stakeholders. I think my, um, yeah, she's sitting next to me, um, uh, Ines, um, she's the buying and production manager. Maybe she can tell a little bit more about the buying uh, practices. Yes, at the moment, uh, hi everyone, first of all. <laughs> um, at the moment, uh, to be honest, during the development and production stage, we are sharing with our suppliers what we require in a jacket or which outcome we would like to achieve. Uh, and from there, the supplier gives us a quotation and 99% of the times it's workable, sometimes it's not workable. Unfortunately, that happens um, during the sales season. And then we go just in an open discussion. Uh, this is the price you would like to achieve. Is that possible or not? Do we have to make adjustments, use different trimmings? Um, so I think mainly in the pricing and definitely in the fair pricing, which we would like to achieve, um, is the open conversation. That's the main, main points we need to achieve all, I think. Um, why, what can we do together? And sometimes um, the supplier also says, okay, wait, maybe we can um, reduce with 50 cents on this jacket because the other jacket, we have a little bit extra margin calculated and that's fine. And I think you have to be transparent um, in this conversation as well. 
Um, and for the fair pricing to add on Elmi her story, um, we're working on living wage, which is definitely a complex project, uh, but something uh, we are going to work with. Um, and I think it's very important. And I think in every stage in the supply chain, you should take your responsibility. And it's definitely, definitely, definitely not always easy, but I think um, a challenge is definitely worth it. Everything which is easy is not always with the best outcome. Thank you. Um, I see a, a hand raised in one of the uh, participants, Preeti Osa. Um, I can allow you to speak with a button. Uh, so I will press that button now. So please uh, go ahead. Preeti? Are you still there? You have to unmute. Yeah, hello. Yes. yes. Yeah, and, uh, actually, I was also uh, going to be inquiring about the union, and uh, it was already answered. Okay. Uh, and, uh, that was the concern that uh, the kind of sector it is, it's a mixed sector, formal and informal together. And it uh, in such a situation, unionizing is a challenge. And uh, the, so uh, we have not been able to go into details here because that was probably not the uh, the intent of this uh, workshop, but how? The, what are the challenges for unionizing a sector that is kind of a mixed sector? So some of the things were already answered, but in some, if somebody wants to say something, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, um, Ashraf uh, Farad. You want to? Yeah. So I can uh, speak about the, you know, uh, labor laws in Pakistan. The, the law, uh, which is Industrial Relations Act, is very uh, restrictive uh, uh, to, to form the unions because workers have, to, I mean, the concept is freedom of association, but there are many, many uh, things which a worker has to do. And the first and foremost is to get a recognition certificate from the employer. So if your employer say that, you know, I, I don't know that person, he's not my employee, he's not my worker. So, I mean, uh, uh, th that is perhaps the biggest uh, hurdle in way of forming a union. Then workers have to do a lot of uh, documentation and uh, the, you know, unfortunately, the labor departments, the labor administration is not very supportive of, of forming unions in Pakistan. So, <clears throat> so the the problem uh, I have mentioned the problem. So the way out is to uh, change the law according. You know the law should be in uh, consonance with the international labor organizations uh, convention, uh, which is about the freedom of association. So the workers should be you know facilitated to form unions through. Uh, the amendments in the existing labor laws. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, need to, uh, I think I think I can add something with uh, for her. Um, thanks, Preeti, for taking these issues on board. I mean, you are rightly mentioned that this, this is formal and mix of formal and informal uh, uh, workplace. Uh, yes, we have a um, registered trade union in Bangladesh, but pro you know when unionization is every year's uh, problem in the south con uh, subcontinental countries. Like you know when you are trying to organize yourself in the factories, then you are going through lots of uh, hassle and difficulties. Like uh, the major hassle is the uh, insecurity of job. Uh, most of the workers who firstly try to join in the uh, unions, they um, and lose the job some majorly, majorly. So this is one of the factor is uh, very important need to be addressed. Like uh, freedom of associations is very important in the workplace for a good uh, for ensuring a good workplace. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more point here uh, that you know when Pakistan came in when the partition uh, happened in uh, the subcontinent. We have a very good law, uh, which was uh, formulated in 1926. And the name of that law is Trade Union Act 1926. And the founder of Pakistan was uh, uh, the person who uh, you know, drafted that law. So the Trade Union Act was uh, 
uh, cancelled in uh, the late 50s and another law was made by the martial law administrator in 1969 so we need to you know go back to that law and see and you know we need to make amendments uh, to suit uh, uh, today's realities but uh, you know the concept of freedom of association should be reflected in the laws in pakistan and for that i have heard emily uh, talking about uh, the trade union uh, freedom of association project so perhaps we need to join hands to ensure uh, the right of association in pakistan thank you thank you yeah we are coming uh, to an end already of this uh, session so i would like to give uh, all the panelists like a last uh, word to uh, to address also the audience. Um, Elmi, is there something you would like to say to all the participants that are in the in the session today? Um, who, um, well, first, thank you for for listening, of course. Um, and I hope it has been helpful. Um, the main point that I wanted to make or that we want to make um uh, is that don't be afraid to collaborate um with your suppliers with uh, other stakeholders with the uh, unions uh, collaboration is key too for improvement that's our uh, main uh, goal thank even you. if you're not there that's uh, still okay <laughs> thank you Chiu? yeah thank you very much i would say uh, it sounds obvious but the importance of taking uh, the first step I mean, it takes time to build trust among stakeholders uh, and it also takes time to become adept at conducting uh, engagement and the dialogue uh, yourself. So taking the first step, I would say, in dialogue is important because experience, best practices and results uh, come with time. And so I will add the, um, the link to our concept in the, in the chat. So if everyone who's interested can take a look there. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, Ashraf. And Farad, you can decide who talks first. <laughs> you are on mute, Ashraf. Thank you very much for the um, opportunities and uh, thanks uh, for all the audience. Uh, the major takeout is no compliance, no business. So uh, if no compliance is no business, so we should work together for a compliance sector, for a compliance industry. So social dialogues and stakeholders engagement is the major part of this and they take a major role in this way. So that's the way we can go ahead with such a potential sectors in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. Uh, thank you, Ashra. And um, yeah, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all the people who have been involved in this discussion. Uh, I think uh, the compliance should be, uh, should have some uh, tangible uh, results. You know, we have been in this process of uh, compliance and, uh, uh, you know, auditing in uh, the, you know, production countries. Perhaps now we need to, uh, you know, take some measures uh, to, to have a more meaningful uh, uh, engagement with the uh, sourcing countries. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, less uh, uh, incident of occupational safety and health hazards and accidents in the production countries. Uh, increased uh, uh, number of um, good labor unions, uh, you know, uh, decreased number of uh, uh, cases of discrimination at the workplaces because you know, I have mentioned in my uh, response that women are being discriminated, child labor is prevalent. And I think uh, what Ashraf has said about the fair pricing, I think it is the key. So we, need, we also need to have uh, you know, uh, a, a real uh, good wages in, uh, in the production countries. And uh, uh, it can only be ensured if we have some meaningful dialogue amongst the the stakeholders and some tangible results as i have mentioned that increased number of trade unions less number of uh, decreased number of accidents and uh, you know and decreased number of cases of discrimination in in pakistan and eradication of child labor in pakistan thank you thank you farat yeah i think um Thank you all uh, participants, uh, uh, panelists. Um, I think it's clear that uh, 
that uh, stakeholder engagement is uh, is something more than a, a tick of uh, checklist uh, exercise. Uh, it, it is about uh, uh, preparation and then uh, really the willingness to enter into a di dialogue with a range of stakeholders, not only your suppliers, but also trade unions, labor representatives, representatives and other uh, organizations. And um, yeah, we do that uh, because of it had the interest and and rights of, of the rights holders that uh, should be at the center of the due diligence uh, process. Um, so I hope uh, we have seen in the chat some links to the publications that uh, that we published, um, uh, reproduced as uh, Together for Decent Letter Consortium. Jules has also in the chat put a link to the, uh, the, com the information of the Meaningful uh, Stakeholder Dialogue uh, program where the English version will uh, come uh, soon of the, the concept uh, on stakeholder dialogue. Uh, I would like to thank you all who participated in the call and I really wish you um, a good rest of the week with uh, other sessions of the OECD uh, Forum on Garment and Footwear. Um, please reach out to us if there's any questions left or if there's something you would like to engage uh, on with us. And um, we wish you a, pre a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.